Section 1 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 1. On the 7th of May, 1696, William landed in Holland. Thence he proceeded to Flanders, and took command of the Allied forces, which were collected in the neighborhood of Ghent. Villeroy and Boufleur were already in the field. All Europe waited impatiently for great news from the Netherlands, but waited in vain. No aggressive movement was made. The object of the generals on both sides was to keep their troops from dying of hunger, and it was an object by no means easily attained. The treasuries both of France and England were empty. Lewis had, during the winter, created with great difficulty and expense a gigantic magazine at Givet on the frontier of his kingdom. The buildings were commodious and of vast extent. The quantity of provender laid up in them for horses was immense. The number of rations for men was commonly estimated at from three to four millions. But early in the spring, Athlone and Cohorn had, by a bold and dexterous move, surprised Givet, and had utterly destroyed both storehouses and stores. France, already fainting from exhaustion, was in no condition to repair such a loss. Sieges such as those of Mons and Namur were operations too costly for her means. The business of her army now was not to conquer, but to subsist. The army of William was reduced to straits not less painful. The material wealth of England, indeed, had not been very seriously impaired by the drain which the war had caused, but she was suffering severely from the defective state of that instrument by which her material wealth was distributed. Saturday, the 2nd of May, had been fixed by Parliament as the last day on which the clipped crowns, half-crowns and shillings were to be received by tail in payment of taxes the exchequer was besieged from dawn till midnight by an immense multitude it was necessary to call in the guards for the purpose of keeping order on the following monday began a cruel agony of a few months which was destined to be succeeded by many years of almost unbroken prosperity most of the old silver had vanished the new silver had scarcely made its appearance about four million sterling in ingots and hammered coin were lying in the vaults of the exchequer and the milled money as yet came forth very slowly from the mint alarmist predicted that the wealthiest and most enlightened kingdom in europe would be reduced to the state of those barbarous societies in which a mat is bought with a hatchet and a pair of moccasins with a piece of venison there were indeed some hammered pieces which had escaped mutilation and sixpences not clipped within the innermost ring were still current this old money and the new money together made up a scanty stock of silver which with the help of gold was to carry the nation through the summer the manufacturers generally contrived though with extreme difficulty to pay their workmen in coin the upper classes seem to have lived to a great extent on credit even an opulent man seldom had the means of discharging the weekly bills of his baker and butcher a promissory note however subscribed by such a man was readily taken in the district where his means and character were well known the notes of the wealthy money changers of lombard street circulated widely the paper of the bank of england did much service and would have done more but for the unhappy air into which the parliament had recently been led by harley and foley the confidence which the public had felt in that powerful and opulent company had been shaken by the act which established the land bank it might well be doubted whether there would be room for the two rival institutions and of the two the younger seemed to be the favorite of the government and of the legislature the stock of the bank of england had gone rapidly down from a hundred and ten to eighty-three meanwhile the goldsmiths who had from the first been hostile to the great corporation were plotting against it they collected its paper from every quarter and on the fourth of may when the exchequer had just swallowed up most of the old money 
and when scarcely any of the new money had been issued, they flocked to Grocer's Hall and insisted on immediate payment. A single goldsmith demanded thirty thousand pounds. The directors in this extremity acted wisely and firmly. They refused to cash the notes which had been thus maliciously presented, and left the holders to seek a remedy in Westminster Hall. Other creditors who came in good faith to ask for their due were paid. The conspirators affected to triumph over the powerful body which they hated and dreaded. The bank which had recently begun to exist under such splendid auspices, which had seemed destined to make a revolution in commerce and in finance, which had been the boast of London and the envy of Amsterdam, was already insolvent, ruined, dishonored. Wretched pasconades were published, the trial of the land bank for murdering the Bank of England, the last will and testament of the Bank of England, the epitaph of the Bank of England, the inquest of the Bank of England. But in spite of all this clamor and all this wit, the correspondence of the States General reported that the Bank of England had not really suffered in the public esteem, and that the conduct of the goldsmiths was generally condemned. The directors soon found it impossible to procure silver enough to meet every claim which was made on them in good faith. They then bethought them to a new expedient. They made a call of twenty per cent on the proprietors, and thus raised a sum which enabled them to give every applicant fifteen per cent in milled money on what was due to him. They returned him his note after making a minute upon it that part had been paid. A few notes thus marked are still preserved among the archives of the bank as memorials of that terrible year. The paper of the corporation continued to circulate, but the value fluctuated violently from day to day, and indeed from hour to hour for the public mind was in so excitable a state that the most absurd lie which a stock-jobber could invent sufficed to send the price up or down. At one time the discount was only six per cent, at another time twenty-four per cent. A ten-pound note, which had been taken in the morning as worth more than nine pounds, was often worth less than eight pounds before night. Another, and at that conjuncture a more effectual substitute for a metallic currency, owed its existence to the ingenuity of Charles Montagu. He had succeeded in engrafting on Harley's land bank bill a clause which empowered the government to issue negotiable paper bearing interest at the rate of three pence a day on a hundred pounds. In the midst of the general distress and confusion appeared the first exchequer bills, drawn for various amounts from a hundred pounds down to five pounds. These instruments were rapidly distributed over the kingdom by the post and were everywhere welcome. The Jacobites talked violently against them in every coffee-house, and wrote much detestable verse against them, but to little purpose. The success of the plan was such that the ministers at one time resolved to issue twenty shilling bills and even fifteen shilling bills for the payment of the troops, but it does not appear that this resolution was carried into effect. It is difficult to imagine how, without the exchequer bills, the government of the country could have been carried on during that year. Every source of revenue had been affected by the state of the currency, and one source, on which the Parliament had confidently reckoned for the means of defraying more than half the charge of the war, had yielded not a single farthing. The sum expected from the land bank was near two million six hundred thousand pounds. Of this sum one half was to be subscribed, and one quarter paid up by the first of August. The king, just before his departure, had signed a warrant appointing certain commissioners, among whom Harley and Foley were the most eminent, to receive the names of the contributors. A great meeting of persons interested in the scheme was held in the hall of the Middle Temple. One office was opened at Exeter Change, another at Mercer's Hall. Forty agents went down into the country and announced to the landed gentry on every shire the approach of the golden age of high rents and low interest. The Council of Regency, in order to set an example to the nation, put down the king's name for five thousand pounds and the newspapers assured the world that the subscription would speedily be filled. 
but when three weeks had passed away it was found that only fifteen hundred pounds had been added to the five thousand contributed by the king many wondered at this yet there was little cause for wonder the sum which the friends of the project had undertaken to raise was a sum which only the enemies of the project could furnish the country gentlemen wished well to harley's scheme but they wished well to it because they wanted to borrow money on easy terms and wanting to borrow money they were of course not able to lend it the money class alone could supply what was necessary to the existence of the land bank and the land bank was avowedly intended to diminish the profits to destroy the political influence and to lower the social position of the moneyed class as the users did not choose to take on themselves the expense of putting down usury the whole plan failed in a manner which if the aspect of public affairs had been less alarming would have been exquisitely ludicrous the day drew near the neatly ruled pages of the subscription book at mercer's hall were still blank the commissioners stood aghast in their distress they applied to the government for indulgence many great capitalists they said were desirous to subscribe but stood aloof because the terms were too hard there ought to be some relaxation would the council of regency consent to an abatement of three hundred thousand pounds the finances were in such a state and the letters in which the king represented his wants were so urgent that the council of regency hesitated the commissioners were asked whether they would engage to raise the whole sum with this abatement their answer was unsatisfactory they did not venture to say they could command more than eight hundred thousand pounds the negotiation was therefore broken off the first of august came and the whole amount contributed by the whole nation to the magnificent undertaking from which so much had been expected was two thousand one hundred pounds just at this juncture portland arrived from the continent he had been sent by william with charge to obtain money at whatever cost and from whatever quarter the king had strained his private credit in holland to procure bread for his army but all was insufficient he wrote to his ministers that unless they could send him a speedy supply his troops would either rise in mutiny or desert by thousands he knew he said that it would be hazardous to call parliament together during his absence but if no other resource could be devised that hazard must be run the council of regency in extreme embarrassment began to wish that the terms hard as they were which had been offered by the commissioners at mercer's hall had been accepted the negotiation was renewed shrewsbury godolphin and portland as agents for the king had several conferences with harley and foley who had recently pretended that eight hundred thousand pounds were ready to be subscribed to the land bank the ministers gave assurances that if at this conjuncture even half that sum were advanced those who had done this service to the state should in the next session be incorporated as a national land bank harley and foley at first promised with an air of confidence to raise what was required but they soon went back on their word they showed a great inclination to be punctilious and quarrelsome about trifles at length the eight hundred thousand pounds dwindled to forty thousand and even the forty thousand could be had only on hard conditions so ended the great delusion of the land bank the commission expired and the offices were closed and now the council of regency almost in despair had recourse to the bank of england two hundred thousand pounds was the very smallest sum which would suffice to meet the king's most pressing wants would the bank of england advance that sum the capitalists who led the chief sway in that corporation were in bad humor and not without reason but fair words earnest entreaties and large promises were not spared all the influence of montague which was justly great was exerted the directors promised to do their best but they apprehended that it would be impossible for them to raise the money without making a second call of twenty per cent on their constituents it was necessary that the question should be submitted to a general court in such a court more than six hundred persons were entitled to vote and the result might well be doubted the proprietors were summoned to meet on the fifteenth of august at grocer's hall during the painful interval of suspense shrewsbury wrote to his master in language more tragic than is often found in official letters 
if this should not succeed god knows what can be done anything must be tried and ventured rather than lie down and die on the fifteenth of august a great epoch in the history of the bank the general court was held in the chair say sir john hublin the governor who was also lord mayor of london and what would in our time be thought strange a commissioner of the admiralty sir john in a speech every word which had been written and had been carefully considered by the directors explained the case and implored the assembly to stand by king william there was at first a little murmuring if our notes would do it was said we should be most willing to assist his majesty but two hundred thousand pounds in hard money at a time like this the governor announced explicitly that nothing but gold or silver would supply the necessities of the army in flanders at length the question was put to the vote and every hand in the hall was held up for sending the money the letters from the dutch embassy informed the states general that the events of that day had bound the bank and the government together in close alliance and that several of the ministers had immediately after the meeting purchased stock merely in order to give a pledge of their attachment to the body which had rendered so great a service to the state meanwhile strenuous exertions were making to hasten the recoinage since the restoration the mint had like every other public establishment in the kingdom been a nest of idlers and jobbers the important office of warden worth between six and seven hundred a year had become a mere sinecure and had been filled by a succession of fine gentlemen who were well known at the hazard table of whitehall but who never condescended to come near the tower this office had just become vacant and montague had obtained it for newton the ability the industry and the strict uprightness of the great philosopher speedily produced a complete revolution throughout the department which was under his direction he devoted himself to his task with an activity which left no time to spare for those pursuits in which he had surpassed archimedes and galileo till the great work was completely done he resisted firmly and almost angrily every attempt that was made by men of science here or on the continent to draw him away from his official duties the old officers of the mint had thought it a great feat to coin silver to the amount of fifteen thousand pounds in a week when montague talked of thirty or forty thousand these men of form and precedent pronounced the thing impracticable but the energy of the young chancellor of the exchequer and of his friend the warden accomplished far greater wonders soon nineteen mills were going at once in the tower as fast as men could be trained to work in london bands of them were sent off to other parts of the kingdom mints were established at bristol york exeter norwich and chester this arrangement was in the highest degree popular the machinery and the workmen were welcomed to the new stations with ringing of bells and the firing of guns the weekly issue increased to sixty thousand pounds to eighty thousand to a hundred thousand and at length to a hundred and twenty thousand yet even this issue though great not only beyond precedent but beyond hope was scanty when compared with the demands of the nation nor did all the newly stamped silver pass into circulation for during the summer and autumn those politicians who were for raising the denomination of the coin were active and clamorous and it was generally expected that as soon as the parliament should reassemble the standard would be lowered of course no person who thought it probable that he should at a day not far distant be able to pay a debt of a pound with three crown pieces instead of four was willing to part with a crown piece till that day arrived most of the milled pieces were therefore hoarded may june and july passed away without any perceptible increase in the quantity of good money it was not till august that the keenest observer could discern the first faint signs of returning prosperity end of section one recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington section two chapter twenty two of the history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. T. Macduff. The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. The distress of the common people was severe, 
and was aggravated by the follies of magistrates and by the arts of malcontents. A squire, who was one of the quorum, would sometimes think it's his duty to administer to his neighbors at this trying conjecture what seemed to him to be equity. And as no two of these rural praetors had exactly the same notion of what was equitable, their edicts added confusion to confusion. In one parish people were in outrageous violation of the law, threatened with the stocks if they refused to take clipped shillings by tail. In the next parish it was dangerous to pay such shillings except by weight. The enemies of the government at the same time labored indefatigably in their vocation. They harangued in every place of public resort, from the chocolate house in St. James Street to the sanded kitchen of the alehouse on the village green. In verse and prose they incited the suffering multitude to rise up in arms. Of the tracts which they published at this time, the most remarkable was written by a deprived priest named Grascombe, of whose ferocity and scurrility the most respectable nonjurors had long been ashamed. He now did his best to persuade the rabble to tear in pieces those members of Parliament who had voted for the restoration of the currency. It would be too much to say that the malignant industry of this man, and of men like him, produced no effect on a population which was doubtless severely tried. There were riots in several parts of the country, but riots which were suppressed with little difficulty, and as far as can be discovered without the shedding of a drop of blood. In one place a crowd of poor ignorant creatures, excited by some knavish agitator, besieged the house of a Whig member of Parliament, and clamorously insisted on having their short money changed. The gentlemen consented, and desired to know how much they had brought. After some delay they were able to produce a single clipped half-crown. Such tumults as this were at a distance exaggerated into rebellions and massacres. At Paris it was gravely asserted, in print, that in an English town which was not named, a soldier and a butcher had quarreled about a piece of money, that the soldier had killed the butcher, that the butcher's man had snatched up a cleaver and killed the soldier, that a great fight had followed, and that fifty dead bodies had been left on the ground. The truth was that the behavior of the great body of the people was beyond all praise. The judges, when in September they returned from their circuits, reported that the temper of the nation was excellent. There was a patience, a reasonableness, a good nature, a good faith, which nobody had anticipated. Everybody felt that nothing but mutual help and mutual forbearance could prevent the dissolution of society. A hard creditor, who sternly demanded payment to the day in milled money, was pointed at in the streets and was beset by his own creditors with demands which soon brought him to reason. Much uneasiness had been felt about the troops. It was scarcely possible to pay them regularly. If they were not paid regularly, it might well be apprehended that they would supply their wants by rapine, and such rapine it was certain that the nation, altogether unaccustomed to military exaction and oppression, would not tamely endure. But strange to say, there was, through this trying year, a better understanding than had ever been known between the soldiers and the rest of the community. The gentry, the farmers, the shopkeepers supplied the redcoats with necessaries in a manner so friendly and liberal that there was no brawling and no marauding. Severely as these difficulties have been felt, Lemitage writes, they have produced one happy effect. They have shown how good the spirit of the country is. No person, however favorable his opinion of the English may have been, could have expected that a time of such suffering would have been a time of such tranquillity. Men who loved to trace in the strangely complicated maze of human affairs the marks of more than human wisdom were of the opinion that, but for the interference of a gracious providence, the plan so elaborately devised by great statesmen and great philosophers would have failed, completely and ignominiously. Often since the Revolution the English had been sullen and querulous, unreasonably jealous of the Dutch, and disposed to put the worst construction on every act of the king. Had the 4th of May found our ancestors in such a mood, it can scarcely be doubted that sharp distress, irritating minds already irritable, would have caused an outbreak which must have shaken and might have subverted the throne of William. Happily, at the moment at which the loyalty of the nation was put to the most severe test, the king was more popular than he had ever been since the day on which the crown was tendered to him in the banqueting house. The plot which had been laid against his life had excited general disgust and horror. His reserved manners, his foreign attachments, were forgotten. 
he had become an object of personal interest and of personal affection to the people. They were everywhere coming in crowds to sign the instrument which bound them to defend and to avenge him. They were everywhere carrying about in their hats the badges of their loyalty to him. They could hardly be restrained from inflicting summary punishment on the few who still dared openly to question his title. Jacobite was now a synonym for cutthroat. Noted Jacobite laymen had just planned a foul murder. Noted Jacobite priests had, in the face of the day, and in the administration of a solemn ordinance of religion, indicated their approbation of that murder. Many honest and pious men who thought that their allegiance was still due to James had indignantly relinquished all connection with zealots who seemed to think that a righteous end justified the most unrighteous means. Such was the state of public feeling during the summer and autumn of 1696. And therefore it was that hardships, which in any of the seven preceding years would certainly have produced a rebellion and might perhaps have produced a counter-revolution, did not produce a single tumult too seriously to be suppressed by the constable's staff. Nevertheless, the effect of the commercial and financial crisis in England was felt through all the fleets and armies of the coalition. The great source of subsidies was dry. No important military operation could anywhere be attempted. Meanwhile, overtures tending to peace had been made, and a negotiation had been opened. Callier, one of the ablest of the many able envoys in the service of France, had been sent to the Netherlands, and had held many conferences with Dijkveld. Those conferences might, perhaps, have come to a speedy and satisfactory close, had not France, at this time, won a great diplomatic victory in another quarter. Louis had, during seven years, been scheming and laboring in vain to break the great array of potentates whom the dread of his might and of his ambition had brought together and kept together. But during seven years all his arts had been baffled by the skill of William, and when the Eighth Campaign opened the Confederacy had not weakened by a single desertion. Soon, however, it began to be suspected that the Duke of Savoy was secretly treating with the enemy. He solemnly assured Galway, who represented England at the court of Turin, that there was not the slightest ground for such suspicions, and sent to William letters filled with professions of zeal for the common cause, and with earnest entreaties for more money. This dissimulation continued, till a French army, commanded by Catinat, appeared in Piedmont. Then the Duke threw off his disguise, concluded peace with France, joined his troops to those of Catinat, marched into the Milanese, and informed the allies whom he had just abandoned, unless they wished to have him for an enemy, they must declare Italy neutral ground. The courts of Vienna and Madrid, in great dismay, submitted to the terms which he dictated. William expostulated and protested in vain. His influence was no longer what it had been. The general opinion of Europe was that the riches and the credit of England were completely exhausted, and both her confederates and her enemies imagined that they might safely treat her with indignity. Spain, true to her inevitable maxim that everything ought to be done for her and nothing by her, had the effrontery to reproach the prince to whom she owed it that she had not lost the Netherlands and Catalonia, because he had not sent troops and ships to defend her possessions in Italy. The imperial ministers formed and executed resolutions gravely affecting the interests of the coalition, without consulting him who had been the author and the soul of the coalition. Louis had, after the failure of the assassination plot, made up his mind to the disagreeable necessity of recognizing William, and had authorized Callier to make a declaration to that effect. But the defection of Savoy, the neutrality of Italy, the disunion among the Allies, and above all, the distresses of England, exaggerated as they were in all the letters which the Jacobites of Saint-Germain received from the Jacobites of London, produced a change. The tone of Callier became high and arrogant. He went back from his word and refused to give any pledge that his master would acknowledge the Prince of Orange as the King of Great Britain. The joy was great among the non-jurors. They had always, they said, been certain that the great monarch would not be so unmindful of his own glory and of the common interest of sovereigns as to abandon the cause of his unfortunate guests and to call an usurper his brother. They knew from the best authority that his most Christian majesty had lately at Fontainebleau given satisfactory assurances on the subject to King James. Indeed, there is reason to believe that the project of an invasion of our island was again seriously discussed at Versailles. Catinet's army was now at liberty. 
France, relieved from all the apprehension on the side of Savoy, might spare twenty thousand men for a descent on England, and if the misery and discontent here were such as was generally reported, the nation might be disposed to receive foreign deliverers with open arms. So gloomy was the prospect which lay before William when, in the autumn of 1696, he quitted his camp in the Netherlands for England. His servants here, meanwhile, were looking forward to his arrival with very strong and very various emotions. The whole political world had been thrown into confusion by a cause which did not at first appear commensurate to such an effect. During his absence, the search for the Jacobites who had been concerned in the plots of the preceding winter had not been intermitted and of these Jacobites none was in greater peril than Sir John Fenwick. His birth, his connections, the high situations which he had filled, the indefatigable activity with which he had during several years labored to subvert the government, and the personal insolence with which he had treated the deceased queen, marked him out as a man fit to be made an example. He succeeded, however, in concealing himself from the offices of justice till the first heat of pursuit was over. In his hiding place he thought of an ingenious device which might, as he conceived, save him from the fate of his friends Charnock and Parkins. Two witnesses were necessary to convict him. It appeared from what passed on the trials of his accomplices that there were only two witnesses who could prove his guilt, Porter and Goodman. His life was safe if either of these men could be persuaded to abscond. Fenwick was not the only person who had strong reason to wish that Porter or Goodman or both might be induced to leave England. Aylesbury had been arrested and committed to the Tower, and he well knew that if these men appeared against him, his head would be in serious danger. His friends and Fenwick's raised what was thought a sufficient sum, and two Irishmen, or in the phrase of the newspaper of that day, bog trotters, a barber named Clancy and a disbanded captain named Donla, undertook the work of corruption. The first attempt was made on Porter. Clancy contrived to fall in with him at a tavern, threw out significant hints, and, finding that those hints were favorably received, opened a regular negotiation. The terms offered were alluring, three hundred guineas down, three hundred more, as soon as the witness should be beyond sea, a handsome annuity for life, a free pardon from King James, and a secure retreat in France. Porter seemed inclined, and perhaps was really inclined, to consent. He said that he still was what he had been, that he was at heart attached to the good cause, but that he had been tried beyond his strength. Life was sweet. It was easy for men who had never been in danger to say that none but a villain would save himself by hanging his associates, but a few hours in Newgate, with the near prospect of a journey on a sledge to Tyburn, would teach such boasters to be more charitable. After repeatedly conferring with Clancy, Porter was introduced to Fenwick's wife, Lady Mary, a sister of the Earl of Carlisle. Everything was soon settled. Don Loch made the arrangements for the flight. A boat was in waiting. The letters which were to secure to the fugitive the protection of King James were prepared by Fenwick. The hour and place were fixed at which Porter was to receive the first installment of the promised reward. But his heart misgave him. He had, in truth, gone such lengths that it would have been madness in him to turn back. He had sent Charnock, King, Keys, Friend, Parkin, Rookwood, Cranburn to the gallows. It was impossible that such a Judas could ever be really forgiven. In France, among the friends and comrades of those whom he had destroyed, his life would not be worth one day's purchase. No pardon under the great seal would avert the stroke of the avenger of blood. Nay, who could say that the bribe now offered was not a bait intended to lure the victim to the place where a terrible doom awaited him? Porter resolved to be true to that government under which alone he could be safe. He carried to Whitehall information of the whole intrigue, and he received full instructions from the ministers. On the eve of the day fixed for his departure, he had a farewell meeting with Clancy at a tavern. Three hundred guineas were counted out on the table. Porter pocketed them and gave a signal. Instantly, several messengers from the office of the Secretary of State rushed into the room and produced a warrant. The unlucky barber was carried off to prison, tried for his offense, convicted, and pilloried. This mishap made Fenwick's situation more perilous than ever. At the next session for the City of London, a bill of indictment against him for high treason was laid before the grand jury. Porter and Goodman appeared as witnesses for the Crown, and the bill was found. Fenwick now thought it was high time to steal away to the Continent. Arrangements were made for his passage. He quitted his hiding place and repaired to Romney Marsh. 
There he hoped to find shelter till the vessel which was to convey him across the channel should arrive. For though Hunt's establishment had been broken up, there were still in that dreary region smugglers who carried out more than one lawless trade. It chanced that two of these men had just been arrested on a charge of harboring traitors. The messenger who had taken them into custody was returning to London with them when, on the high road, he met Fenwick face to face. Unfortunately for Fenwick, no face in England was better known than his. "'It is Sir John,' said the officer to the prisoners. "'Stand by me, my good fellows, and I warrant you, you will have your pardons and a bag of guineas besides.' The offer was too tempting to be refused, but Fenwick was better mounted than his assailants. He dashed through them, pistol in hand, and was soon out of sight. They pursued him. The hue and cry was raised, the bells of all the parish churches of the marsh rang out the alarm. The whole country was up, every path was guarded, every thicket was beaten, every hut was searched, and at length the fugitive was found, in bed. Just then a bark of very suspicious appearance came in sight. She soon approached the shore and showed English colors, but to the practice eyes of the Kentish fishermen she looked much like a French privateer. It was not difficult to guess her errand. After waiting a short time in vain for her passenger, she stood out to sea. Fenwick, unluckily for himself, was able so far to elude the vigilance of those who had charge of him as to scrawl with a lead pencil a short letter to his wife. Every line contained evidence of his guilt. All, he wrote, was over. He was a dead man, unless indeed his friends could, by dint of solicitation, obtain a pardon for him. Perhaps the united entreaties of all the Howards might succeed. He would go abroad, he would solemnly promise never again to set foot on English ground, and never to draw sword against the government. Or would it be possible to bribe a juryman or two to starve out the rest? That, he wrote, or nothing can save me. This billet was intercepted in its way to the post and sent up to Whitehall. Fenwick was soon carried to London and brought before the Lord's Justices. At first he held high language and bade defiance to his accusers. He was told that he had not always been so confident, and his letter to his wife was laid before him. He had not till then been aware that it had fallen into the hands for which it was not intended. His distress and confusion became great. He felt that if he were instantly set before a jury, a conviction was inevitable. One chance remained. If he could delay his trial for a short time, the judges would leave town for their circuits. A few weeks would be gained, and in the course of a few weeks something might be done. He addressed himself particularly to the Lord Steward, Devonshire, with whom he had formerly had some connection of a friendly kind. The unhappy man declared that he threw himself entirely on the royal mercy, and offered to disclose all that he knew touching the plots of the Jacobites. That he knew much, nobody could doubt. Devonshire advised his colleagues to postpone the trial till the pleasure of William could be known. This advice was taken. The king was informed of what had passed, and he soon sent an answer directing Devonshire to receive the prisoner's confession in writing, and to send it over to the Netherlands with all speed. End of Section 2 Chapter 22 The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay Reading by S.T. Macduff Chapter 22, Section 3 of the History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.T. Macduff. The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 3. Fenwick had now to consider what he should confess. Had he, according to his promise, revealed all that he knew, there can be no doubt that his evidence would have seriously affected many Jacobite noblemen, gentlemen, and clergymen. But though he was very unwilling to die, attachment to his party was in his mind a stronger sentiment than the fear of death. The thought occurred to him that he might construct a story which might possibly be considered as sufficient to earn his pardon, which would at least put off his trial some months yet would not injure a single sincere adherent of the banished dynasty, nay, which would cause distress and embarrassment to the enemies of that dynasty, and which would fill the court, the council, and the parliament of William with fears and animosities. He would divulge nothing that could affect those true Jacobites who had repeatedly awaited with pistols loaded and horses saddled 
the landing of the rightful king accompanied by a French army. But if there were false Jacobites who had mocked their banished sovereign year after year with professions of attachment and promises of service, and yet had at every great crisis found some excuse for disappointing him, and who were at that moment among the chief supports of the usurper's throne, why should they be spared? That there were such false Jacobites, high in political office and in military command, Fenwick had good reason to believe. He could indeed say nothing against them to which a court of justice would have listened, for none of them had ever entrusted him with any message or letter for France, and all that he knew about their treachery he had learned at second hand and third hand. But of their guilt he had no doubt. One of them was Marlborough. He had, after betraying James to William, promised to make reparation by betraying William to James, and had at last, after much shuffling, again betrayed James and made peace with William. Godolphin had practiced similar deception. He had long been sending fair words to St. Germain. In return for those fair words he had received a pardon, and with this pardon in his secret drawer he had continued to administer the finances of the existing government. To ruin such a man would be a just punishment for his baseness, and a great service to King James. Still more desirable was it to blast the fame and destroy the influence of Russell and Shrewsbury. Both were distinguished members of that party which had, under different names, been during three generations implacably hostile to the kings of the House of Stuart. Both had taken a great part in the Revolution. The names of both were subscribed to the instrument which had invited the Prince of Orange to England. One of them was now his Minister for Maritime Affairs, the other his Principal Secretary of State, but neither had been constantly faithful to him. Both had, soon after his ascension, bitterly resented his wise and magnanimous impartiality, which to their minds, disordered by party spirit, seemed to be unjust and ungrateful partiality for the Tory faction, and both had in their spleen listened to agents from St. Germain. Russell had vowed by all that was most sacred that he would himself bring back his exiled sovereign. But the vow was broken as soon as it had been uttered, and he, to whom the royal family had looked as to a second monk, had crushed the hopes of that family at La Hogue. Shrewsbury had not gone such lengths, yet he too, while out of humor with William, had tampered with the agents of James. With the power and reputation of these two great men was closely connected the power and reputation of the whole Whig party. That party, after some quarrels which were in truth quarrels of lovers, was now cordially reconciled to William and bound to him by the strongest ties. If those ties could be dissolved, if he could be induced to regard with distrust and aversion the only set of men which was on principle and with enthusiasm devoted to his interests, his enemies would indeed have reason to rejoice. With such views as these, Fenwick delivered to Devonshire a paper so cunningly composed that it would probably have brought some severe calamity on the prince to whom it was addressed, had not that prince been a man of singularly clear judgment and singularly lofty spirit. The paper contains scarcely anything respecting those Jacobite plots in which the writer had himself been concerned, and of which he intimately knew all the details. It contained nothing which could be of the smallest prejudice to any person who was really hostile to the existing order of things. The whole narrative was made up of stories, too true for the most part, yet resting on no better authority than hearsay, about the intrigues of some eminent warriors and statesmen who, whatever their formal conduct might have been, were now at least hearty in support of William. Godolphin, Fenwick averred, had accepted a seal at the Board of Treasury with the sanction and for the benefit of King James. Marlborough had promised to carry over the army, Russell to carry over the fleet. Shrewsbury, while out of office, had plotted with Middleton against the government and king. Indeed, the Whigs were now the favorites of St. Germain. Many old friends of hereditary right were moved to jealousy by the preference which James gave to the new converts. Nay, he had been heard to express his confident hope that the monarchy would be set up again by the very hands which had pulled it down. Such was Fenwick's confession. Devonshire received it and sent it by express to the Netherlands, without intimating to any of his fellow councillors what it contained. The accused ministers afterwards complained bitterly of this proceeding. Devonshire defended himself by saying that he had been specially deputed by the king to take the prisoner's information and was bound, as a true servant of the crown, to transmit that information to his majesty and to his majesty alone. The messenger sent by Devonshire found William at Lou. The king read the confession and saw at once with what objects it had been drawn up. It contained little more than what he had long known 
and had long with politic and generous dissimulation affected not to know. If he spared, employed, and promoted men who had been false to him, it was not because he was their dupe. His observation was quick and just, his intelligence was good, and he had, during some years, had in his hands proofs of much that Fenwick had only gathered from wandering reports. It has seemed strange to many that a prince of high spirit and acrimonious temper should have treated servants who had so deeply wronged him with a kindness hardly to be expected from the meekest of human beings. But William was emphatically a statesman. Ill-humor, the natural and pardonable effect of many bodily and much mental suffering, might sometimes impel him to give a tart answer, but never did he on any important occasion indulge his angry passions at the expense of the great interests of which he was the guardian. For the sake of those interests, proud and imperious as he was by nature, he submitted patiently to galling restraints, bore cruel indignities and disappointments with the outward show of serenity, and not only forgave but often pretended not to see offenses which might well have moved him to bitter resentment. He knew that he must work with such tools as he had. If he was to govern England, he must employ the public men of England, and in his age the public men of England, with much of a peculiar kind of ability, were, as a class, low-minded and immoral. There were doubtless exceptions. Such was Nottingham among the Tories, and Summers among the Whigs. But the majority, both of the Tory and of the Whig ministers of William, were men whose characters had taken the ply in the days of anti-Puritan reaction. They had been formed in two evil schools, in the most unprincipled of courts and the most unprincipled of oppositions. A court which took its character from Charles, an opposition headed by Shaftesbury. From men so trained, it would have been unreasonable to expect disinterested and steadfast fidelity to any cause. But though they could not be trusted, they might be used, and they might be useful. No reliance could be placed on their principles, but much reliance might be placed on their hopes and on their fears, and of the two kings who laid claim to the English crown, the king from whom there was much to hope and most to fear was the king in possession. If, therefore, William had little reason to esteem these politicians his hearty friends, he had still less reason to number them among his hearty foes. Their conduct towards him, reprehensible as it was, might be called upright when compared with their conduct toward James. To the reigning sovereign they had given valuable service, to the banished sovereign little more than promises and professions. Shrewsbury might, in a moment of resentment or of weakness, have trackabed with Jacobite agents, but his general conduct had proved that he was as far as ever from being a Jacobite. Godolphin had been lavish of fair words to the dynasty which was out, but he had thriftily and skilfully managed the revenues of the dynasty which was in. Russell had sworn that he would desert the English fleet, but he had burned the French fleet. Even Marlborough's known treasons, for his share in the disaster of Brest and the death of Talmash was unsuspected, had not done so much harm as his exertions at Walcourt, at Cork, at Kinsale had done good. William had therefore wisely resolved to shut his eyes to perfidy, which, however disgraceful it might be, had not injured him, and still to avail himself with proper precautions of the eminent talents which some of his unfaithful counsellors possessed. Having determined on this course and having long followed it with happy effect, he could not but be annoyed and provoked by Fenwick's confession. Sir John, it was plain, thought himself a Machiavel. If his trick succeeded, the princess, whom it was most important to keep in good humour, would be alienated from the government by the disgrace of Marlborough. The whole Whig party, the firmest support of the throne, would be alienated by the disgrace of Russell and Shrewsbury. In the meantime, not one of those plotters whom Fenwick knew to have been deeply concerned in plans of insurrection, invasion, assassination, would be molested. This cunning schemer should find that he had not to do with a novice. William, instead of turning his accused servants out of their places, sent the confession to Shrewsbury and desired that it might be laid before the Lord Justices. I am astonished, the king wrote, at the fellow's effrontery. You know me too well to think that such stories as his can make any impression on me. Observe this honest man's sincerity. He has nothing to say except against my friends. Not a word about the plans of his brother Jacobites. The king concluded by directing the Lord's justices to send Fenwick before a jury with all speed. The effect produced by William's letter was remarkable. Every one of the accused persons behaved himself in a manner singularly characteristic. Marlborough, the most culpable of all, preserved a serenity mild, majestic, and slightly contemptuous. Russell, scarcely less criminal than Marlborough, went into a towering passion and breathed nothing but vengeance against the villainous informer. 
Godolphin, uneasy but wary, reserved and self-possessed, prepared himself to stand on the defensive. But Shrewsbury, who of all the four was the least to blame, was utterly overwhelmed. He wrote in extreme distress to William, acknowledged with warm expressions of gratitude the king's rare generosity, and protested that Fenwick had malignantly exaggerated and distorted mere trifles into enormous crimes. My Lord Middleton, such was the substance of the letter, was certainly in communication with me about the time of the Battle of La Hogue. We are relations. We frequently met. We supped together just before he returned to France. I promised to take care of his interests here. He, in return, offered to do me good offices there. But I told him that I had offended too deeply to be forgiven, and that I would not stoop to ask forgiveness. This, Shrewsbury averred, was the whole extent of his offense. It is but too fully proved that this confession was by no means ingenuous nor is it likely that William was deceived. But he was determined to spare the repentant traitor the humiliation of owning a fault and accepting a pardon. I can see, the king wrote, no crime at all in what you have acknowledged. Be assured that these calumnies have made no unfavorable impression on me. Nay, you shall find that they have strengthened my confidence in you. A man hardened in depravity would have been perfectly contented with an acquittal so complete, announced in language so gracious. But Shrewsbury was quite unnerved by a tenderness which he was conscious that he had not merited. He shrank from the thought of meeting the master whom he had wronged, and by whom he had been forgiven, and of sustaining the gaze of the peers, among whom his birth and his abilities had gained for him a station of which he felt that he was unworthy. The campaign in the Netherlands was over, the secession of Parliament was approaching, the King was expected with the first fair wind. Shrewsbury left town and retired to the wolds of Gloucestershire. In that district, then one of the wildest in the south of the island, he had a small country seat, surrounded by pleasant gardens and fish-ponds. William had in his progress a year before visited this dwelling, which lay far from the nearest high road and from the nearest market town, and had been much struck by the silence and loneliness of the retreat in which he found the most graceful and splendid of English courtiers. At one in the morning of the 6th of October, the king landed at Margate. Late in the evening he reached Kensington. The following morning a brilliant crowd of ministers and nobles pressed to kiss his hand, but he missed one face which ought to have been there, and asked where the Duke of Shrewsbury was and when he was expected in town. The next day came a letter from the Duke, averring that he had just had a bad fall in hunting. His side had been bruised, his lungs had suffered, he had spit blood, and could not venture to travel. That he had fallen and hurt himself was true, but even those who felt most kindly towards him suspected, and not without strong reason, that he had made the most of his convenient misfortune, and that if he had not shrunk from appearing in public, he would have performed the journey with little difficulty. His correspondence told him that, if he was really as ill as he thought himself, he would do well to consult the physicians and surgeons of the capital. Summers especially implored him in the most earnest manner to come up to London. Every hour's delay was mischievous. His grace must conquer his sensibility. He had only to face calumny courageously, and it would vanish. The king, in a few kind lines, expressed his sorrow for the accident. "'You are much wanted here,' he wrote. "'I am impatient to embrace you, and to assure you that my esteem for you is undiminished.' Shrewsbury answered that he had resolved to resign the seals. Summers adjured him not to commit so fatal an error— if at that moment his grace should quit office, what could the world think except that he was condemned by his own conscience? He would, in fact, plead guilty. He would put a stain on his own honor and on the honor of all who laid in the same accusation. It would no longer be possible to treat Fenwick's story as a romance. Forgive me, Summers wrote, for speaking after this free manner, for I do own I can scarce be temperate in this matter. A few hours later William himself wrote to the same effect. I have so much regard for you that if I could... I would positively interdict you from doing what must bring such grave suspicions on you. At any time I should consider your resignation as a misfortune to myself, but I protest to you that at this time it is on your account more than on mine that I wish you to remain in my service. Sunderland, Portland, Russell, and Wharton joined their entreaties to their masters, and Shrewsbury consented to remain secretary in name, but nothing could induce him to face the Parliament which was about to meet. A litter was sent down to him from London, but to no purpose. He set out, but he declared that he found it impossible to proceed, and took refuge again in his lonely mansion among the hills. 
While these things were passing, the members of both houses were from every part of the kingdom going up to Westminster. To the opening of the session, not only England, but all Europe looked forward with intense anxiety. Public credit had been deeply injured by the failure of the land bank. The restoration of the currency was not yet half accomplished. The scarcity of money was still distressing. Much of the milled silver was buried in private repositories as fast as it came forth from the mint. Those politicians who were bent on raising the denomination of the coin had found too ready audience from a population suffering from under severe pressure, and at one time the general voice of the nation had seemed to be on their side. Of course, every person who thought it likely that the standard would be lowered hoarded as much money as he could hoard, and thus the cry for little shillings aggravated the pressure from which it had sprung. Both the allies and the enemies of England imagined that her resources were spent, that her spirit was broken, that the commons, so often querulous and parsimonious, even in tranquil and prosperous times, would now positively refuse to bear any additional burden, and would, with an importunity not to be withstood, insist on having peace at any price. But all these prognostications were confounded by the firmness and ability of the Whig leaders, and by the steadiness of the Whig majority. On the 20th of October the Houses met. William addressed to them a speech remarkable, even among all the remarkable speeches in which his own high thoughts and purposes were expressed in the dignified and judicious language of Summers. There was, the King said, great reason for congratulation. It was true that the funds voted in the preceding session for the support of the war had failed, and that the recoinage had produced great distress. Yet the enemy had obtained no advantage abroad. The state had been torn by no convulsion at home. The loyalty shown by the army and by the nation under severe trials had disappointed all the hopes of those who wished evil to England. Overtures tending to peace had been made. What might be the result of those overtures was uncertain, but this was certain, that there could be no safe or honorable peace for a nation which was not prepared to wage vigorous war. I am sure we shall all agree in opinion that the only way of treating with France is with our swords in our hands. End of section 3, chapter 22 of the History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Reading by S. T. Macduff. Section 4 of chapter 22 of the History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 4. The Commons returned to their chamber and fully read the speech from the chair. A debate followed which resounded through all Christendom. That was the proudest day of Montague's life and one of the proudest days in the history of the English Parliament. In 1798, Burke held up the proceedings of that day as an example to the statesmen whose hearts had failed them in the conflict with the gigantic power of the French Republic. In 1822, Huskisson held up the proceedings of that day as an example to a legislature which, under the pressure of severe distress, was tempted to alter the standard of value and to break faith with the public creditor. Before the House rose, the young Chancellor of the Exchequer, whose ascendancy since the ludicrous failure of the Tory scheme of finance was undisputed, proposed and carried three memorial resolutions. The first, which passed with only one muttered no, declared that the Commons would support the King against all foreign and domestic enemies, and would enable him to prosecute the war with vigor. The second, which passed, not without opposition, but without a division, declared that the standard of money should not be altered in fineness, weight, or denomination. The third, against which not a single opponent of the government dared to raise his voice, pledged the House to make good all the deficiencies of all parliamentary funds established since the King's accession. The task of framing an answer to the royal speech was entrusted to a committee exclusively composed of Whigs, Montague was chairman, and the eloquent and animated address which he drew up may still be read in the journals with interest and pride. Within a fortnight, two millions and a half were granted for the military expenditures of the approaching year, 
and nearly as much for the maritime expenditure. Provision was made without any dispute for 40,000 seamen. About the amount of the land force there was a division. The king asked for 87,000 soldiers, and the Tories thought that number too large. The vote was carried by 223 to 67. The malcontents flattered themselves during a short time that the vigorous resolutions of the commons would be nothing more than resolutions, that it would be found impossible to restore public credit, to obtain advances from the capitalists, or to wring taxes out of the distressed population, and that therefore the 40,000 seamen and the 87,000 soldiers would exist only on paper. How? who had been more cowed than was usual with him on the first day of the session, attempted, a week later, to make a stand against the ministry. The king, he said, must have been misinformed, or his majesty never would have felicitated Parliament on the tranquil state of the country. I come from Gloucester. I know that part of the kingdom well. The people are all living on alms, or ruined by paying alms. The soldier helps himself, sword in hand to what he wants. There have been serious riots already, and still more serious riots are to be apprehended. The disappropriation of the House was strongly expressed. Several members declared that in their counties everything was quiet. If Gloucester were in a more disturbed state than the rest of England, might not the cause be that Gloucester was cursed with a more malignant an unprincipled agitator than all the rest of England could show. Some Gloucester gentlemen took issue with Howe on the facts. There was no such distress, they said, no such discontent, no such rioting as he had described. In that county, as in every other county, the great body of the population was fully determined to support the king in waging a vigorous war till he could make an honorable peace. In fact, the tide had already turned. From the moment at which the commons notified their fixed determination not to raise the denomination of the coin, the milled money began to come forth from a thousand strong boxes and private drawers. There was still pressure, but that pressure was less and less felt day by day. The nation, though still suffering, was joyful and grateful. Its feelings resembled those of a man who, having been long tortured by a malady which has embittered his life, has at least made up his mind to submit to the surgeon's knife, who has gone through a cruel operation with safety, and who, though still smarting from the steel, sees before him many years of health and enjoyment, and thanks God that the worst is over. Within four days after the meeting of Parliament, there was a perceptible improvement in trade. The discount on bank notes had diminished by one-third. The price of those wooden tallies, which, according to a usage handed to us from a rude age, were given as receipts for sums paid into the exchequer, had risen. The exchanges, which had during many months been greatly against England, had begun to turn. Soon the effect of the magnanimous firmness of the House of Commons was felt at every court in Europe. So high, indeed, was the spirit of that assembly that the King had some difficulty in preventing the Whigs from moving and carrying a resolution that an address should be presented to him, requesting him to enter into no negotiation with France till she should have acknowledged him as King of England. Such an address was unnecessary. The votes of the Parliament had already forced on Lewis the conviction that there was no chance of counter-revolution. There was as little chance that he would be able to effect that compromise of which he had, in the course of the negotiations, thrown out hints. It was not to be hoped that either William or the English nation would ever consent to make the settlement of the English crown a matter of bargain with France and even had William and the English nation been disposed to purchase peace by such sacrifice of dignity, there would have been insuperable difficulties in another quarter. James could not endure to hear the expedient which Lewis had suggested. I can bear, the exile said to his benefactor, 
I can bear with Christian patience to be robbed by the Prince of Orange, but I will never consent to be robbed by my own son. Louis never again mentioned the subject. Calliers received orders to make the concession on which the peace of the civilized world depended. He and Dykvelt came together at The Hague before Baron Lillenroth, the representative of the King of Sweden, whose mediation the belligerent powers had accepted. Dykvelt informed Lillenroth that the most Christian king had engaged, whenever the treaty of peace should be signed, to recognize the Prince of Orange as King of Great Britain, and added, with a very intelligible allusion to the compromise proposed by France, that the recognition would be without restriction, condition, or reserve. Calliers then declared that he confirmed, in the name of his master, what Dykvelt had said. A letter from Pryor, containing the good news, was delivered to James Vernon, the Under Secretary of State in the House of Commons. The tidings ran along the benches, such is Vernon's expression, like fire in a field of stubble. A load was taken away from every heart, and all was joy and triumph. The Whig members might indeed well congratulate each other, for it was to the wisdom and resolution which they had shown in a moment of extreme danger and distress that their country was indebted for the near prospect of an honorable peace. Meanwhile, public credit, which had, in the autumn, sunk to the lowest point, was fast reviving. Ordinary financiers stood aghast when they learned that more than five millions were required to make good the deficiencies of past years. But Montague was not an ordinary financier. A bold and simple plan proposed by him, and popularly called the general mortgage, restored confidence. New taxes were imposed, old taxes were augmented or continued, and thus a consolidated fund was formed sufficient to meet every just claim on the state. The Bank of England was at the same time enlarged by a new subscription, and the regulations for the payment of the subscription were framed in such a manner as to raise the value both of the notes of the corporation and of the public securities. Meanwhile, the mints were pouring forth the new silver faster than ever. The distress, which began on the 4th of May, 1696, which was almost insupportable during the five succeeding months, and which became lighter from the day on which the Commons declared their immutable resolution to maintain the old standard, ceased to be painfully felt in March, 1697. Some months were still to elapse before credit completely recovered from the most tremendous shock that it has ever sustained. But already the deep and solid foundation had been laid on which was to rise the most gigantic fabric of commercial prosperity that the world had ever seen. The great body of the Whigs attributed the restoration of the health of the state to the genius and firmness of their leader Montague. His enemies were forced to confess, sulkily and sneeringly, that every one of his schemes had succeeded. The first bank subscription, the second bank subscription, the recoinage, the general mortgage, the exchequer bills. But some Tories muttered that he deserved no more praise than a prodigal who stakes his whole estate at hazard, and has a run of good luck. England had indeed passed safely through a terrible crisis and was the stronger for having passed through it. But she had been in imminent danger of perishing, and the minister who had exposed her to that danger deserved not to be praised, but to be hanged. Others admitted that the plans which were popularly attributed to Montague were excellent, but denied that those plans were Montague's. The voice of detraction, however, was for a time drowned by the loud applauses of the Parliament and the city, the authority which the Chancellor of the Exchequer exercised in the House of Commons was unprecedented and unrivaled. In the Cabinet his influence was daily increasing. He had no longer a superior at the Board of Treasury. In consequence of Fenwick's confession, the last Tory who held a great and efficient office in the State had been removed, and there was at length a purely Whig ministry. It had been impossible to prevent reports about that confession from getting abroad. 
The prisoner, indeed, had found means of communicating with his friends, and had doubtless given them to understand that he had said nothing against them, and much against the creatures of the usurper. William wished the matter to be left to the ordinary tribunals, and was most unwilling that it should be debated elsewhere. But his counsellors, better acquainted than himself with the temper of large and divided assemblies, were of opinion that a parliamentary discussion, though perhaps undesirable, was inevitable. It was in the power of a single member of either house to force on such a discussion, and in both houses there were members who, some from a sense of duty, some from mere love of mischief, were determined to know whether the prisoner had, as it was rumored, brought grave charges against some of the most distinguished men in the kingdom. If there must be an inquiry, it was surely desirable that the accused statesman should be the first to demand it. There was, however, one great difficulty. The Whigs, who formed the majority of the lower house, were ready to vote, as one man for the entire absolution of Russell and Shrewsbury, had no wish to put a stigma on Marlborough, who was not in place, and therefore excited little jealousy. But a strong body of honest gentlemen, as Wharton called them, could not, by any management, be induced to join in a resolution acquitting Godolphin. To them, Godolphin was an eyesore. All the other Tories who, in the earlier years of William's reign, had borne a chief part in the direction of affairs, had, one by one, been dismissed. Nottingham, Trevor, Leeds, were no longer in power. Pembroke could hardly be called a Tory, and had never been really in power. But Godolphin still retained his post at Whitehall, and to the men of the Revolution it seemed intolerable that one who had sate at the council board of Charles and James, and who had voted for a regency, should be the principal minister of finance. Those who felt thus had learned with malicious delight that the first lord of the treasury was named in the confession about which all the world was talking, and they were determined not to let slip so good an opportunity of ejecting him from office. On the other hand, everybody who had seen Fenwick's paper, and who had not, in the drunkenness of factious animosity, lost all sense of reason and justice, must have felt that it was impossible to make a distinction between two parts of that paper, and to treat all that related to Shrewsbury and Russell as false, and all that related to Godolphin as true. This was acknowledged even by Wharton, who of all public men was the least troubled by scruples or by shame. If Godolphin had steadfastly refused to quit his place, the Whig leaders would have been in a most embarrassing position. But a politician of no common dexterity undertook to extricate them from their difficulties. In the art of reading and managing the minds of the men, Sunderland had no equal, and he was, as had been during several years, desirous to see all the great posts in the kingdom filled by Whigs. By his skillful management, Godolphin was introduced to go into the royal closet, and to request permission to retire from office, and William granted that permission with a readiness by which Godolphin was much more surprised than pleased. One of the methods employed by the Whig Junto, for the purpose of instituting and maintaining through all the ranks of the Whig party a discipline never before known, was the frequent holding of meetings of members of the House of Commons. Some of those meetings were numerous, others were select. The larger were held at the Rose, a tavern frequently mentioned in the political pasquinades of that time, the smaller at Russell's in Covent Garden, or at Summers in Lincoln's Inn Fields. On the day on which Godolphin resigned his great office two select meetings were called. In the morning the place of assembly was Russell's house. In the afternoon there was a fuller muster at the Lord's Keeper's, Fenwick's confession, which till that time had probably been known only by rumor to most of those who were present, was read. The indignation of the hearers was strongly excited, particularly by one passage, of which the sense seemed to be that not only Russell, not only Shrewsbury, but the great body of the Whig party was, and had long been, at heart, 
Jacobite. The fellow insinuates, it was said, that the assassination plot itself was a Whig scheme. The general opinion was that such a charge could not be lightly passed over. There must be a solemn debate and decision in Parliament. The best course would be that the King should himself see and examine the prisoner, and that Russell should then request the royal permission to bring the subject before the House of Commons. As Fenwick did not pretend that he had any authority for the stories which he had told except mere hearsay, there could be no difficulty in carrying a resolution branding him as a slanderer, and an address to the throne requesting that he might be forthwith brought to trial for high treason. The opinion of the meeting was conveyed to William by his ministers, and he consented, though not without reluctance, to see the prisoner. Fenwick was brought into the royal closet at Kensington. A few of the great officers of state and the crown lawyers were present. Your papers, Sir John, said the king, are altogether unsatisfactory. Instead of giving me an account of the plots formed by you and your accomplices, plots of which all the details must be exactly known to you, you tell me stories, without authority, without date, without place, about noblemen and gentlemen with whom you do not pretend to have any intercourse. In short, your confession appears to be a contrivance intended to screen those who are really engaged in designs against me, and to make me suspect and discard those in whom I have good reason to place confidence. If you look for any favor from me, give me, this moment and on this spot, a full and straightforward account of what you know of your own knowledge. Fenwick said that he was taken by surprise and asked for time. No, sir, said the king. For what purpose can you want time? You may indeed want time if you mean to draw up another paper like this, but what I require is a plain narrative of what you have yourself done and seen, and such a narrative you can give, if you will, without pen and ink. Then Fenwick positively refused to say anything. Be it so, said William, I will neither hear you nor hear from you any more. Fenwick was carried back to his prison. He had at his audience shown a boldness and determination which surprised those who had observed his demeanor. He had, ever since he had been in confinement, appeared to be anxious and dejected. Yet now, at the very crisis of his fate, he had braved the displeasure of the prince whose clemency he had, a short time before, submissively implored. In a very few hours the mystery was explained. Just before he had been summoned to Kensington, he had received from his wife intelligence that his life was in no danger, that there was only one witness against him, that she and her friends had succeeded in corrupting Goodman. End of section 4 Recording by Hugh Gillis Section 5 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 5. Goodman had been allowed a liberty which was afterwards, with some reason, made matter of charge against the government. For his testimony was most important, his character was notoriously bad. The attempts which had been made to seduce Porter proved that, if money could save Fenwick's life, money would not be spared, and Goodman had not, like Porter, been instrumental in sending Jacobites to the gallows, and therefore was not, like Porter, bound to the cause of William by an indissoluble tie. The families of the imprisoned conspirators employed the agency of a cunning and daring adventurer named O'Brien. This man knew Goodman well. Indeed, they had belonged to the same gang of highwaymen. They met at the Dog in Drury Lane, a tavern which was frequented by lawless and desperate men. O'Brien was accompanied by another Jacobite of determined character. A simple choice was offered to Goodman to abscond and to be rewarded, 
with an annuity of five hundred a year or to have his throat cut on the spot he consented half from cupidity half from fear o'brien was not a man to be tricked as clancy had been he never parted company with goodman from the moment when the bargain was struck till they were at saint germain on the afternoon of the day on which fenwick was examined by the king at kensington it began to be noised abroad that goodman was missing he had been many hours absent from his house he had not been seen at his usual haunts at first a suspicion arose that he had been murdered by the jacobites and this suspicion was strengthened by a singular circumstance just after his disappearance a human head was found severed from the body to which it belonged and so frightfully mangled that no feature could be recognized the multitude possessed by the notion that there was no crime which an irish papist might not be found to commit was inclined to believe that the fate of godfrey had befallen another victim on inquiry however it seemed certain that goodman had designedly withdrawn himself a proclamation appeared promising a reward of a thousand pounds to any person who should stop the runaway but it was too late this event exasperated the whigs beyond measure no jury could now find fenwick guilty of high treason was he then to escape was a long series of offenses against the state to go unpunished merely because to those offenses had now been added the offense of bribing a witness to suppress his evidence and to desert his bail was there no extraordinary method by which justice might strike a criminal who solely because he was worse than other criminals was beyond the reach of the ordinary law such a method there was a method authorized by numerous precedents a method used both by papists and by protestants during the troubles of the sixteenth century a method used both by roundheads and by cavaliers during the troubles of the seventeenth century a method which scarcely any leader of the tory party could condemn without condemning himself a method of which fenwick could not decently complain since he had a few years before been eager to employ it against the unfortunate monmouth to that method the party which was now supreme in the state determined to have a recourse soon after the commons had met on the morning of the sixth of november russell rose in his place and requested to be heard the task which he had undertaken required courage not of the most respectable kind but to him no kind of courage was wanting sir john fenwick he said had sent to the king a paper in which grave accusations were brought against some of his majesty's servants and his majesty had at the request of his accused servants graciously given orders that this paper should be laid before the house the confession was produced and read the admiral then with spirit and dignity worthy of a better man demanded justice for himself and shrewsbury if we are innocent clear us if we are guilty punish us as we deserve i put myself on you as on my country and am ready to stand or fall by your verdict it was immediately ordered that fenwick should be brought to the bar with all speed cutts who sate in the house as member for cambridgeshire was directed to provide a sufficient escort and was especially enjoined to take care that the prisoner should have no opportunity of making or receiving any communication oral or written on the road from newgate to westminster the house then adjourned till the afternoon at five o'clock then a late hour the mace was again put on the table candles were lighted and the house and lobby were carefully cleared of strangers fenwick was in attendance under a strong guard he was called in and exhorted from the chair to make a full and ingenuous confession he hesitated and evaded i cannot say anything without the king's permission his majesty may be displeased if what ought to be known only to him should be divulged to others he was told that his apprehensions were groundless the king well knew that it was the right and the duty of his faithful commons to inquire into whatever concerned the safety of his person and of his government i may be tried in a few days said the prisoner 
I ought not to be asked to say anything which may rise up in judgment against me. You have nothing to fear, replied the speaker. If you only make a full and free discovery, no man ever had reason to repent of having dealt candidly with the commons of England. Then Fenwick begged for delay. He was not a ready orator. His memory was bad. He must have time to prepare himself. He was told, as he had been told a few days before in the royal closet, that, prepared or unprepared, he could not but remember the principal plots in which he had been engaged and the names of his chief accomplices. If he would honestly relate that it was quite impossible that he could have forgotten, the house would make all fair allowances and would grant him time to recollect subordinate details. Thrice he was removed from the bar, and thrice he was brought back. He was solemnly informed that the opportunity then given him in earning the favor of the commons would probably be the last. He persisted in his refusal and was sent back to Newgate. It was then moved that his confession was false and scandalous. Coningsby proposed to add that it was a contrivance to create jealousies between the king and good subject for the purpose of screening real traitors. A few implacable and unmanageable Whigs, whose hatred of Godolphin had not been mitigated by his resignation, hinted their doubts whether the whole paper ought to be condemned. But after a debate in which Montague particularly distinguished himself, the motion was carried. One or two voices cried, No! but nobody ventured to demand a division. Thus far all had gone smoothly, but in a few minutes the storm broke forth. The terrible words, Bill of Attainder, were pronounced, and all the fiercest passions of both the great factions were instantly browsed. The Tories had been taken by surprise, and many of them had left the house. Those who remained were loud in declaring that they never would consent to such a violation of the first principles of justice. The spirit of the Whigs was not less ardent, and their ranks were unbroken. The motion for leave to bring in a bill attaining Sir John Fenwick was carried very late at night by 179 votes to 61, but it was plain that the struggle would be long and hard. In truth, party spirit had seldom been more strongly excited. On both sides there was doubtless much honest zeal, and on both sides an observant eye might have detected fear, hatred, and cupidity disguised under specious pretenses of justice and public good. The baleful heat of fraction rapidly warmed into life-poisonous creeping things which had long been lying torpid, discarded spies, and convicted false witnesses. The leavings of the scourge, the braining iron, and the shears. Even Fuller hoped that he might again find dupes to listen to him. The world had forgotten him since his pillaring. He now had the effrontery to write to the speaker, begging to be heard at the bar and promising much important information about Fenwick and others. On the 9th of November, the speaker informed the House that he had received this communication. But the House very properly refused even to suffer the letter of so notorious a villain to be read. On the same day the Bill of Attainder, having been prepared by the Attorney and Solicitor General, was brought in and read a first time. The House was full and the debate sharp. John Manley, member for Bossany, one of those staunch Tories who, in the preceding session, had long refused to sign the Association accused the majority, in no measured terms, of fawning on the court and betraying the liberties of the people. His words were taken down, and, though he tried to explain them away, he was sent to the tower. Seymour spoke strongly against the bill, and quoted the speech which Caesar made in the Roman Senate against the motion that the accomplices of Catiline should be put to death in an irregular manner. A Whig orator keenly remarked that the worthy baron had forgotten that Caesar was grievously suspected of having been himself concerned in Catiline's plot. In this stage, a hundred and ninety-six members voted for the bill, a hundred and four against. A copy was sent to Fenwick in order that he might be prepared to defend himself. He begged to be heard by counsel. His request was granted, and the thirteenth was fixed for the hearing. 
never within the memory of the oldest member had there been such a stir around the house as on the morning of the thirteenth the approaches were with some difficulty cleared and no stranger except peers were suffered to come within the doors of peers the throng was so great that their presence had perceptible influence on the debate even seymour who having formerly been speaker ought to have been peculiarly mindful of the dignity of the commons so strangely forgot himself as once to say my lords fenwick having been formerly given up by the sheriffs of london to the sergeant-at-arms was put to the bar attended by two barristers who were generally employed by jacobite culprits sir thomas powis and sir bartholomew shower counsel appointed by the house appeared in support of the bill the examination of the witness and the arguments of the advocates occupied three days porter was called in and interrogated it was established not indeed by legal proof but by such moral proof as determines the conduct of men in the affairs of common life that goodman's absence was to be attributed to a scheme planned and executed by fenwick's friends with fenwick's privity secondary evidence of what goodman if he had been present would have been able to prove was after a warm debate admitted his confession made on oath and subscribed by his hand was put in some of the grand jurymen who had found the bill against sir john gave an account of what goodman had sworn before them and their testimony was confirmed by some of the petty jurymen who had convicted another conspirator no evidence was produced in behalf of the prisoner after counsel for him and against him had been heard he was sent back to his cell then the real struggle began it was long and violent the house repeatedly sate from daybreak till near midnight once the speaker was in the chair fifteen hours without intermission strangers were freely admitted for it was felt that since the house chose to take on itself the functions of the court of justice it ought like a court of justice to sit with open doors the substance of the debates had consequently been preserved in a report meagre indeed when compared with the reports of our time but for that age unusually full every man of note in the house took part in the discussion the bill was opposed by finch with that fluent and sonorous rhetoric which had gained him the name of silver tongue and by howe with all the sharpness both of his wit and of his temper by seymour with his characteristic energy and by harley with his characteristic solemnity on the other side montague displayed the powers of the consummate debater and was zealously supported by Littleton. Conspicuous in the front ranks of the hostile parties were two distinguished lawyers, Simon Harcourt and William Cowper. Both were gentlemen of honorable descent, both were distinguished by their fine persons and graceful manners, both were renowned for eloquence, and both loved learning and learned men. It may be added that both had early in life been noted for prodigality and love of pleasure dissipation had made them poor poverty had made them industrious and though they were still as age is reckoned in the inns of court very young men harcourt only thirty-six cowper only thirty-two they already had the first practice at the bar they were destined to rise still higher to be the bearers of the great seal of the realm and the founders of the patrician houses in politics they were diametrically opposed to each other Harcourt had seen the revolution with disgust, had not chosen to sit in the convention, had with difficulty reconciled his conscience to the oaths, and had tardily and unwillingly signed the association. Cowper had been in arms for the Prince of Orange and a free parliament, and had, in the short and tumultuary campaign which preceded the flight of James, distinguished himself by intelligence and courage. Since summer had been removed to the woolsack, the law offices of the crown had not made a very distinguished figure in the lower house or indeed anywhere else and their deficiencies had been more than once supplied by cowper his skill had at the trial of parkins recovered the verdict which the mismanagement of the solicitor general had for a moment put in jeopardy 
he had been chosen member for Hertford at the general election of 1695, and had scarcely taken his seat when he attained a high place among parliamentary speakers. Chesterfield, many years later, in one of his letters to his son, described Cowper as an orator who never spoke without applause, but who reasoned feebly, and who owed the influence which he long exercised over great assemblies to the singular charm of his style, his voice, and his action. Chesterfield was, beyond all doubt, intellectually qualified to form a correct judgment on such a subject. But it must be remembered that the object of his letters was to exalt good taste and politeness in opposition to much higher qualities. He therefore constantly and systematically attributed the success of the most eminent persons of his age to their superiority, not in solid abilities or acquirements, but in superficial graces of diction and manner. He represented even Marlborough as a man of very ordinary capacity who, solely because he was extremely well-bred and well-spoken, had risen from poverty and obscurity to the height of power and glory. It may confidently be pronounced that both to Marlborough and to Cowper, Chesterfield was unjust. The general who saved the empire and conquered the low countries was assuredly something more than a fine gentleman, and the judge who presided during the nine years in the court of chancery, with the approbation of all parties, must have been something more than a fine disclaimer. Whoever attentively and impartially studies the report of the debates will be of opinion that, on many points which were discussed at great length and with great animation, the Whigs had a decided superiority in argument, but that on the main question the Tories were in the right. It was true that the crime of high treason was brought home to Fenwick by proofs which could leave no doubt on the mind of any man of common sense, and would have been brought home to him according to the strict rules of law. If he had not, by committing another crime, eluded the justice of the ordinary tribunals, it was true that he had, in the very act of professing repentance and imploring mercy, added a new offense to his former offenses that, while pretending to make a perfectly ingenuous confession, he had, with cunning malice, concealed everything which it was for the interest of the government that he should divulge, and proclaim everything which it was for the interest of the government to bury in silence. It was a great evil that he should be beyond the reach of punishment, it was plain that he could be reached only by a bill of pains and penalties, and it could not be denied either that many such bills had passed, or that no such bill had ever passed in a clearer case of guilt or after a fairer hearing. All these propositions the Whigs seemed to have fully established. They had also a decided advantage in the dispute about the rule which requires two witnesses in cases of high treason. The truth is that the rule is absurd. It is impossible to understand why the evidence which would be sufficient to prove that a man has fired at one of his fellow subjects should not be sufficient to prove that he has fired at his sovereign. It can by no means be laid down as a general maxim that the assertion of two witnesses is more convincing to the mind than the assertion of one witness. The story told by one witness may be itself probable. The story told by two witnesses may be extravagant. The story told by one witness may be uncontradicted. The story told by two witnesses may be contradicted by four witnesses. The story told by one witness may be corroborated by a crowd of circumstances. The story told by two witnesses may have no such corroboration. The one witness may be Tillotson or Ken. The two witnesses may be Oates and Bedloe. End of section 5. Recording by Hugh Gillis. Six of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill McGovern. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22. Section 
six. The chiefs of the Tory party, however, vehemently maintained that the law which required two witnesses was of universal and eternal obligation, part of the law of nature, part of the law of God. Seymour quoted the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy to prove that no man ought to be condemned to death by the mouth of a single witness. Caiaphas and his Sanhedrin, said Harley, were ready enough to set up the plea of expediency for a violation of justice. They said, and we have heard such things said, we must slay this man, or the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Yet even Caiaphas and his Sanhedrin, in that foulest act of judicial murder, did not venture to set aside the sacred law which required two witnesses. Even Jezebel, said another orator, did not dare to take Naboth's vineyard from him till she had suborned two men of Belial to swear falsely. If the testimony of one grave elder had been sufficient, it was asked, what would have become of the virtuous Susanna? This last allusion called forth a cry of Apocrypha, Apocrypha, from the ranks of the low churchmen. Over these arguments, which in truth can scarcely have imposed on those who condescended to use them, Montague obtained a complete and easy victory. An eternal law? Where was this eternal law before the reign of Edward the Sixth? Where is it now, except in statutes, which relate only to one very small class of offences? If these texts from the Pentateuch and these precedents from the practice of the Sanhedrin prove anything, they prove the whole criminal jurisprudence of the realm to be a mass of injustice and impiety. One witness is sufficient to convict a murderer, a burglar, a highwayman, an incendiary, a ravisher. Nay, there are cases of high treason in which only one witness is required. One witness can send to Tyburn a gang of clippers and comers. Are you then prepared to say that the whole law of evidence, according to which men have during ages been tried in this country for offenses against life and property, is vicious and ought to be remodeled? If you shrink from saying this, you must admit that we are now proposing to dispense not with a divine ordinance of universal and perpetual obligation, but simply with an English rule of procedure, which applies to not more than two or three crimes, which has not been in force a hundred and fifty years, which derives all its authority from an act of Parliament, and which may therefore be, by another act, abrogated or suspended without offence to God or men. It was much less easy to answer the chiefs of the opposition when they set forth the danger of breaking down the partition which separates the functions of the legislator from those of the judge. This man, it was said, may be a bad Englishman, and yet his cause may be the cause of all good Englishmen. Only last year we passed an act to regulate the procedure of the ordinary courts in cases of treason. We passed that act because we thought that in those courts the life of a subject obnoxious to the government was not then sufficiently secured. Yet the life of a subject obnoxious to the government was then far more secure than it will be if this house takes on itself to be the supreme criminal judicature in political cases. Warm eulogies were pronounced on the ancient national mode of trial by twelve good men and true, and indeed the advantages of that mode of trial in political cases are obvious. The prisoner is allowed to challenge any number of jurors with cause, and a considerable number without cause. The twelve from the moment at which they are invested with their short magistracy till the moment when they lay it down are kept separate from the rest of the community. Every precaution is taken to prevent any agent of power from soliciting or corrupting them. Every one of them must hear every word of the evidence and every argument used on either side. The case is then summed up by a judge who knows that, if he is guilty of partiality, he may be called to account by the great inquest of the nation. In the trial of Fenwick, at the bar of the House of Commons, 
all these securities were wanting. Some hundreds of gentlemen, every one of whom had much more than half made up his mind before the case was opened, performed the functions of both judge and jury. They were not restrained, as a judge is restrained, by the sense of responsibility. For who was to punish a parliament? They were not selected, as a jury is selected, in a manner which enables the culprit to exclude his personal and political enemies. The arbiters of his fate came in and went out as they chose. They heard a fragment here and there of what was said against him, and a fragment here and there of what was said in his favor. During the progress of the bill they were exposed to every species of influence. One member was threatened by the electors of his borough with the loss of his seat. Another might obtain a frigate for his brother from Russell. The vote of a third might be secured by the caresses and burgundy of Wharton. In the debates, arts were practiced and passions excited, which are unknown to well-constituted tribunals, but from which no great popular assembly, divided into parties, ever was or ever will be free. The rhetoric of one orator called forth loud cries of, Hear him! Another was coughed and scraped down. A third spoke against time in order that his friends who were supping might come in to divide. If the life of the most worthless man could be sported with thus, was the life of the most virtuous man secure? The opponents of the bill did not, indeed, venture to say that there could be no public danger sufficient to justify an act of attainder. They admitted that there might be cases in which the general rule must bend to an overpowering necessity. But was this such a case? Even if it were granted, for the sake of argument, that Strafford and Monmouth were justly attainted, was Fenwick, like Strafford, a great minister who had long ruled England north of Trent and all Ireland, with absolute power, who was high in the royal favor, and whose capacity, eloquence, and resolution made him an object of dread, even in his fall? Or was Fenwick, like Monmouth, a pretender to the crown, and the idol of the common people? Were all the finest youths of three counties crowding to enlist under his banners? What was he but a subordinate plotter? He had indeed once had good employments, but he had long lost them. He had once had a good estate, but he had wasted it. Eminent abilities and weight of characters he had never had. He was, no doubt, connected by marriage with a very noble family, but that family did not share his political prejudices. What importance, then, had he, except that importance which his persecutors were most unwisely giving him by breaking through all the fences which guard the lives of Englishmen in order to destroy him? Even if he were set at liberty, what could he do but haunt Jacobite coffee-houses, squeeze oranges, and drink the health of King James and the Prince of Wales? If, however, the government, supported by the lords and the commons, by the fleet and the army, by a militia of one hundred and sixty thousand strong, and by the half-million of men who had signed the association, did really apprehend danger from this poor, ruined baronet. The benefit of the Habeas Corpus Act might be withheld from him. He might be kept within four walls as long as there was the least chance of his doing mischief. He could hardly be contented that he was an enemy so terrible that the state could be safe only when he was in the grave. It was acknowledged that precedents might be found for this bill, or even for a bill far more objectionable. But it was said that whoever reviewed our history would be disposed to regard such precedents rather as warnings than as examples. It had many times happened that an act of attainder, passed in a fit of servility or animosity, had, when fortune had changed, or when passion had cooled, been repealed and solemnly stigmatized as unjust. Thus in old times the act which was passed against Roger Mortimer, in the paroxysm of a resentment not unprovoked, had been, at a calmer moment, rescinded, on the ground that, however guilty he might have been, he had not had fair play for his life. Thus, within the memory of the existing generation, the law which attainted Strafford, had been annulled, without one dissentient voice. Nor, it was added, ought it to be left unnoticed, that whether by virtue of the ordinary law of cause and effect, or by the extraordinary judgment of God, 
persons who had been eager to pass bills of pains and penalties had repeatedly perished by such bills no man had ever made a more unscrupulous use of the legislative power for the destruction of his enemies than thomas cromwell and it was by an unscrupulous use of the legislative power that he was himself destroyed if it were true that the unhappy gentleman whose fate was now trembling in the balance had himself formerly borne a part in a proceeding similar to that which was now instituted against him was not this a fact which ought to suggest very serious reflections those who tauntingly reminded fenwick that he had supported the bill which attainted monmouth might perhaps themselves be tauntingly reminded in some dark and terrible hour that they had supported the bill which had attainted fenwick let us remember what vicissitudes we have seen let us from so many signal examples of the inconstancy of fortune learn moderation and prosperity how little we thought when we saw this man a favourite courtier at whitehall a general surrounded with military pomp at hounslow that we should live to see him standing at our bar and awaiting his doom from our lips and how far is it from certain that we may not one day in the bitterness of our souls vainly invoke the protection of those mild laws which we now treat so lightly god forbid that we should ever again be subject to tyranny but god forbid above all that our tyrants should ever be able to plead in justification of the worst that they can inflict upon us precedents furnished by ourselves these topics skilfully handled produced a great effect on many moderate whigs montague did his best to rally his followers we still possess the rude outline of what must have been a most effective peroration gentlemen warn us this or very nearly this seems to have been what he said not to furnish king james with a precedent which if ever he should be restored he may use against ourselves do they really believe that if that evil day shall ever come this just and necessary law will be the pattern which he will imitate no sir his model will be not our bill of attainder but his own not our bill which on full proof and after a most fair hearing inflicts deserved retribution on a single guilty head but his own bill which without a defence without an investigation without an accusation doomed near three thousand people whose only crimes were their english blood and their protestant faith the men to the gallows and the women to the stake that is the precedent which he has set and which he will follow in order that he never may be able to follow it in order that the fear of a righteous punishment may restrain those enemies of our country who wish to see him ruling in london as he ruled at dublin i give my vote for this bill in spite of all the eloquence and influence of the ministry the minority grew stronger and stronger as the debates proceeded the question that leave should be given to bring in the bill had been carried by nearly three to one on the question that the bill should be committed the eyes were a hundred and eighty-six the nose a hundred and twenty-eight on the question that the bill should pass the eyes were a hundred and eighty-nine the nose a hundred and fifty-six on the twenty sixth of november the bill was carried up to the lords before it arrived the lords had made preparations to receive it every peer who was absent from town had been summoned up every peer who disobeyed the summons and was unable to give a satisfactory explanation of his disobedience was taken into custody by black rod on the day fixed for the first reading the crowd on the benches was unprecedented the whole number of temporal lords exclusive of minors roman catholics and non-jurors was about a hundred and forty of these a hundred and five were in their places many thought that the bishops ought to have been permitted if not required to withdraw for by an ancient canon those who ministered at the altars of god were forbidden to take any part in the infliction of capital punishment on the trial of a peer impeached of high treason the prelates always retire and leave the culprit to be absolved or condemned by laymen and surely if it be unseemly that a divine should doom his fellow-creatures to death as a judge it must be still more unseemly that he should doom them to death as a legislator in the latter case as in the former 
he contracts that stain of blood which the church regards with horror it will scarcely be denied that there are some grave objections to the shedding of blood by act of attainder which do not apply to the shedding of blood in the ordinary course of justice in fact when the bill for taking away the life of strafford was under consideration all the spiritual peers withdrew now however the example of cramner who had voted for some of the most infamous acts of attainder that ever passed was thought more worthy of imitation and there was a great muster of lawn sleeves it was very properly resolved that on this occasion the privilege of voting by proxy should be suspended and that the house should be called over at the beginning and at the end of every sitting and that every member who did not answer to his name should be taken into custody meanwhile the unquiet brain of monmouth was teeming with strange designs he had now reached a time of life at which youth could no longer be pleaded as an excuse for his faults but he was more wayward and eccentric than ever both in his intellectual and in his moral character there was an abundance of those fine qualities which may be called luxuries and a lamentable deficiency of those solid qualities which are of the first necessity he had brilliant wit and ready invention without common sense chivalrous generosity and delicacy without common honesty he was capable of rising to the part of the black prince and yet he was capable of sinking to the part of fuller his political life was blemished by some most dishonourable actions yet he was not under the influence of those motives to which most of the dishonourable actions of politicians are to be ascribed he valued power little and money less a fear he was utterly insensible if he sometimes stooped to be a villain for no milder word will come up to the truth it was merely to amuse himself and to astonish other people in civil as in military affairs he loved ambuscades surprises night attacks he now imagined that he had a glorious opportunity of making a sensation of producing a great commotion and the temptation was irresistible to a spirit so restless as his he knew or at least strongly suspected that the stories which fenwick had told on hearsay and which king lords and commons whigs and tories had agreed to treat as calumnies were in the main true was it impossible to prove that they were true to cross the wise policy of william to bring disgrace at once on some of the most eminent men of both parties to throw the whole world into inextricable confusion nothing could be done without the help of the prisoner and with the prisoner it was impossible to communicate directly it was necessary to employ the intervention of more than one female agent the duchess of norfolk was a mordaunt and monmouth's first cousin her gallantries were notorious and her husband had some years before tried to induce his brother nobles to pass a bill for dissolving his marriage but the attempt had been defeated in consequence partly of the zeal with which monmouth had fought the battle of his kinswoman the lady though separated from her lord lived in a style suitable to her rank and associated with many women of fashion among others with lady mary fenwick and with a relation of lady mary named elizabeth lawson by the instrumentality of the duchess monmouth conveyed to the prisoner several papers containing suggestions framed with much art let sir john such was the substance of these suggestions boldly affirm that his confession is true that he has brought accusations on hearsay indeed but not on common hearsay that he has derived his knowledge of the facts which he has asserted from the highest quarters and let him point out a mode in which his veracity may easily be brought to the test let him pray that the earls of portland and romney who are well known to enjoy the royal confidence may be called upon to declare whether they are not in possession of information agreeing with that which he has related let him pray that the king may be requested to lay before the parliament the evidence which caused the sudden disgrace of lord marlborough and any letters which may have been intercepted while passing between saint germain and lord godolphin 
Unless, said Monmouth to his female agents, Sir John is under a fate. Unless he is out of his mind, he will take my counsel. If he does, his life and honour are safe. If he does not, he is a dead man. When this strange intriguer, with his usual license of speech, reviled William for what was in truth one of William's best titles to glory, he is the worst of men, he has acted basely, he pretends not to believe these charges against Rosebery, Russell, Marlborough, Godolphin, and yet he knows, and Monmouth confirmed the assertion by a tremendous oath, he knows that every word of the charges is true. End of section six. Recording by Bill McGovern.